it was this first part here. We've, de we've developed a sector adaptation plan as the subgroup. And one of those objectives was to raise awareness and risks and opportunities. And it was when we came to look at the opportunities that we realized that actually we weren't, we weren't too sure if we'd got any, we weren't too sure what they were. And we had great difficulty in, in identifying them. And it was that that led me uh, to think about it and to suggest perhaps that we could look at it um, more widely. The plan that we've developed is in two parts and it's available on the CADU website. First part is largely narrative uh, and um, it's strategic and dynamic. Um, the second part is the action plan and it details those actions that we believe uh, could be undertaken in order to adapt to what is perceived to be the, uh, the, the main features of the changing climate. Within Wales, um, there have been several moves by Welsh Government, by CADU and by the subgroup of the Historic Environment Group, which is uh, what Louise referred to. Uh, climate Change Strategy for Wales, top left there, uh, was produced um, following the Climate Change Act in 2008 uh, and a five um, volume um, preparing for changing climate, which is top right, uh, was also produced by Welsh Government. They're still there, uh, but they've largely fallen by the wayside, and a new adaptation plan is now being produced by Welsh Government, which we're working in with. The, um, at the same time, in this early stage, the subgroup commissioned a, uh, a study of the impacts of the changing climate on the historic environment, and that's that top centre uh, report. Uh, below that is the summary. Uh, and at about that time, just in order to encourage us to get going, we had these sudden storm surges that occurred, and the, the, the two bottom images either side are of uh, Aberystwyth, where it was uh, the sea coming over the, uh, the key there. Um, the intention on the part of the Welsh Government was to produce a number of sector adaptation plans. Uh, this is a quote, a major feature of our adaptation framework will be the preparation of key sectoral adaptation plans for Wales. Um, again, they're not quite following it through in the way that was originally anticipated, but ours dates back to, to that period. And for those not used to working with climate change, I just felt that I needed to emphasize this difference between the mitigation and adaptation because mitigation is used slightly differently within climate change. It is within the archaeological world where one thinks about the mitigation uh, process. Um, so the mitigation in climate change is to tackle the underlying causes of climate change. That's basically what it's doing. Uh, the activity to reduce the effect of human activity on the climate. The adaptation is tackling the consequences of climate change uh, to reduce the effect of the climate and specifically a change in climate on human activity. So that's the way in which it's, uh, it's looked at. So we're largely concerned with adaptation rather than mitigation, although obviously all organizations uh, should be looking at uh, mitigation also. The plan uh, when we started to produce it, had three main objectives, um, and that was to increase our understanding uh, and knowledge, to build capacity, and to increase resilience. And that was what the action plan was geared towards. That was what we wanted to achieve uh, out of the uh, out of the action plan. On the right hand side are a series of actions that we believe uh, relate to the improving understanding. Um, the um, identify the potential impact. Uh, identify the historic assets at risk, so largely a mapping program and mapping exercise, etc. Um, look at the significance of them and build models to help understand impacts. So that's just the, the understanding of it. The build capacity is more along the lines of issuing guidelines, etc., and working together uh, across organizations. Increasing resilience are those actual physical actions on the ground that we can take that arise from the, uh, from the first two uh, objectives. Essentially, we're looking at hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, rising sea levels, and an increase in storm surges. 
It shows um, latter two, the rising sea levels, the increase in storm surges, of course, that we felt had the greatest impact on the historic environment, although there's little doubt that the other two can also be an issue, particularly with regard to upland peats, etc., uh, and the drier, the drier summers. Uh, we looked at understanding risks to historic assets, uh, and um, there, there, were, there were a large number of risks. This is just a small section of them that we identified, uh, and a table was drawn up from that original report that we commissioned, uh, which looks at the, the main um, change that is going to occur, such as warmer mean temperatures, hotter, drier summers, etc. What that means on the ground, rising sea levels, longer growing season, etc., and then set that against a number of historic environment assets, um, buildings and settlements, marginal and upland, etc. <coughs> and those picked out in red uh, are those that we felt were the most would would suffer the most significant change. And those picked out in green, of which there are two small positives, um, potential uh, for improvement in parks and gardens, perhaps, but actually that's change rather than improvement. Um, less mowing, for example, uh, creation of grasslands, changing plants, uh, and this sort of thing. Um, changes in lifestyle and leisure patterns, buildings and settlements, potentially a small positive there, and we'll look at that later on. So the conclusion was that a relatively small number of assets were at high risk. There were a large potential of assets at moderate risk, and cumulatively, these risks should be considered of high significance. Um, there were slight beneficial outcomes. And so we're still only really sort of suggesting that the outcomes could be at all beneficial, and they were very, very slight and uh, identified. So one of the highest risks, of course, is um, sea level rise. Sediment transport as a result of sea level rise and the movement of marine sands, etc., uh, and burying both by uh, water and by sediment. And yet, how much of a problem really is that? Because this is a cemetery site on Anglesey, tree on the boat, that's created a few years ago now, um, to own a couple. These are well-preserved skeletal remains, uh, and indeed, on the bottom left, you can actually see the original land surface from which the graves were dug, uh, and the grave outlines, early medieval grave outlines. It's unique, it's probably the best preserved of the of, of that surface, that sort of surface from which these burials were dug. And of course it's been preserved because the sand came in immediately afterwards, or indeed even whilst the, uh, the graves were being dug. Top left is an 18th century print which shows it before it started to, uh, to erode. Uh, it had a late medieval chapel on the top of it. And indeed not only the skeletal uh, remains were preserved, but also hair um, because of the uh, anaerobic uh, conditions within the kist. Uh, as the right hand image, uh, the hair runs down over the head, and then you can see it down there on the on the, the sternum. Um, so, quite a remarkable uh, survival. If we look at a settlement that was covered by sand, um, <coughs> this is Rithgar and Anglesey, and again, early medieval well-preserved estuarine settlement alongside the, uh, the Avon Bright, the River Bright. Um, the, the, that. Difficult to see, but there are the small rectangular black um, areas on it are buildings, uh, and then there are three superimposed field systems, one on top of the other, actually four. But, um, so plots followed by ridge and furrow, um, followed by the enclosure of the ridge and furrow, and then eventually the 19th century large field system that is the current one uh, that's there now. Uh, again, an unusual survivor. Um, the buildings turned out to be 8th, 7th, 8th century AD or so. Um, field system similarly. And then Ridge and Furrow, possibly when it became a Cistercian Grange uh, in the 12th century. So a really, really good survivor here. Uh, and this is one of the buildings uh, that was there. I think probably a small early bond settlement, nucleated bond settlement. Most settlements are dispersed. This is nucleated. Uh, and so unusual uh, and, uh, and a good survivor. Again, because the sands were coming in, 
uh, and being driven in, and so it was uh, it was preserved. We've got an increase in knowledge of early medieval settlement. It was a community excavation, so we've got the benefits that last from that. Uh, we've had a partnership with Cherish, which Louise will be talking about, uh, and specifically luminescent stating arising from that. An increased interest from farmers and land managers and improved site management. All these are legacies, of course. Now, they don't just apply to climate change sites, but nonetheless, they are legacies that one can identify uh, with, these, uh, with these sites. Uh, and then finally, um, from marine sediment again, just a different type of preservation. We've got wall paintings, 12th century wall paintings at Rossilly. So this was excavated a while ago. Um, but it encouraged better management of the site, management of the sand on the site so that they were preserved. And it was preserving them within that natural environment that actually <coughs> is, is one of the best ways uh, to do it. So it's a 12th century church with 12th century wall paintings that had been covered in sand exposed and then recovered in sand and, and managed uh, for preservation in that way. Rising sea levels and buried land surfaces, etc. We have the peaks, we've got the Lidstep pig, re remarkable um, survivor that was discovered in uh, 1917, a uh, pig with um, two points, uh, two, um, yeah, um, flint. Uh, points within its neck, which showed it to be possibly killed that way, uh, and a tree uh, lying across its neck. It seems to have escaped, and the tree subsequently uh, covered it uh, after it died, but was not taken by those that killed it. Um, so an interesting narrative there. And then we've got a bot on the um, a cardiganshire on the bottom. Bottom right there, these remarkable forested landscapes. And of course, within the sediments, of the Severn Estuary and elsewhere. Uh, and these are not always marine sediments, but estuarine sediments as well, these very fine clays. We've got the preservation of the, Medi of the Mesolithic footprints at Goldscliff. So is it too bad that we are, they are subsequent, that they buried? Now, okay, they, they subsequently become revealed, but nonetheless, the burial within these sediments has preserved them. Uh, this track of, of Mesolithic footprints at, uh, at Goldcliffe uh, in the Severn Estuary. And likewise, I'm not going into specifically maritime um, environments, um, but the, the, so this is a, a, a boat, is there a, the Barlands Farm boat in the Severn Estuary. Uh, it sank within water, was preserved, but then became covered by sediments subsequently and later on, and then was excavated. Um, from uh, through sediments, um, but was uh, almost certainly alongside a quay. Uh, and the remarkable wood preservation of the wood there that, uh, that exists. Um, I'm not quite sure if you can see the slight shadow that's there, that's, uh, that's behind this. This is a Royal Commission um, aerial photograph, um, and it is indeed a, um, you can see it there, a Lockheed P-38. Uh, lightning called the Maid of Harleff that came down in the 1940s um, and it was covered by sand and preserved that way. It was subsequently exposed and this is the obviously the difficulty of, of, of sand burial but nonetheless it's now covered again and you can't see it um, and so it has these very very short periods of time. Um, it's, uh, we see it quite regularly around the the, the, the sandy beaches of Anglesey where a, a ship's timbers will be exposed and then covered up again. Uh, and we don't see them again for years and years, but all of a sudden they will suddenly appear and then get covered up again. Um, and that's what's happening to, the, um, to, to this, what is probably the best preserved of the Lockheed Lightnings, and simply because it's been preserved in this, file, in this fashion. Three. Three, yeah, fine. Um, the, um, Another legacy, obviously, that we've got well known uh, and, um, and, and covered fully, usually within the press, uh, drier summers increase uh, crop mark and parch marks. And that improves our legacy of understanding uh, and improved management of sites, particularly for curatorial uh, archaeologists. Uh, this was one that was excavated, turned into a, well, there was, there was Neolithic settlement on the site, um, late prehistoric Romano-British uh, ringwork. And with early medieval 
uh, settlement on the site as well. So quite a busy, busy site that we wouldn't have known about otherwise. It's now known about, it's protected, it's scheduled, uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do that otherwise. Uh, and likewise, another example, just about see the rectangular crop mark there. We thought it was a late prehistoric enclosure, but in fact, a uh, magnetometer showed it to be a, a, a Roman fort, um, a small fortlet, probably dating to the invasion period and Anglesey and the first fort to be found there. So again, increasing uh, our, our knowledge. And storm surges and coastal erosion. Coastal erosion does mean sometimes if the resources are there and if they can be found, increased excavation. This is uh, uh, a, a site dating to about a thousand, probably a Viking uh, defended settlement uh, off, the, uh, off the coast of Anglesey. Coastal erosion again, it's a uh, beaker burial. Um, but underlying the beaker burial uh, was a Mesolithic uh, floor, and we've identified several of those now slowly eroding. Um, it does leave a legacy. It's also, of course, uh, destructive, but nonetheless, it does leave a sort of legacy. And then finally, the increased summer temperatures, changes in lifestyle, increase in resorts, perhaps. Is this going to give us an opportunity to invest? Um, does, does this rise in economic prosperity for towns that perhaps are slowly dying? Could they increase? It's a two-edged sword. You might lose what you're trying to preserve because of the increased uh, prosperity. Or indeed, if they are low-lying resorts, they could be, uh, they could, they, they, they could be drowned. Um, this is Bomaris, and one way in which we're tackling that within Wales is to look at urban characterisation uh, and to try and identify what is really significant about certain aspects of those settlements uh, and how best to manage it uh, for the future. And if this can be undertaken, you know, can be done with, 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 with a variety of urban settlements, then, then you have a future management tool. So the, um, the urban characterisation bottom uh, right divides it up into specific areas, um, character areas, and there are the, the, the key um, points of significance are identified for that, uh, and then management recommendations made um, as a result. So the back to the plan, can it lead to improved understanding and management of the historic environment? Uh, and there are certain elements within that action plan which suggest that it can so within the understanding, we've got developed models to help understand the impact of climate change on the historic environment, develop and deliver guidelines. These are things that might not have otherwise happened. Um, and potential benefits and legacies, um, natural non-interventionist adaptation, preservation in situ, perhaps without actually us doing anything. But we could also look at, um, as, as a number of um, the coastal uh, agencies are doing, looking at trying to increase the, um, the natural sands and gravels uh, and, and shingle beaches, etc., to work better as, uh, as natural defences. Um, new archaeological discoveries are coming out, positive interventionist adaptation, which is preserve, record and excavate if the resources can be found. Um, development of new techniques for management and adaptation, which we wouldn't otherwise have concentrated on. Um, we need to make full use of the community engagement, leading to interest and ownership of the past and a greater sense of place. And we heard a bit about that for those that were there in the talks yesterday. Um, and perhaps additional resources for managing the historic environment may become available. Um, the difficulty is, of course, are we just fiddling while Rome burns? What's, if we listen to the, 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 the journalists uh, and, and, and some of those that are serious, quite rightly perhaps seriously concerned, we don't know what the future is going to bring. Uh, and if it does bring uh, climate change, does that actually bring about this complete um, shift in population through, on the world stage? Um, then I don't think any of this is going to help too much anyway. Um, but nonetheless, we have to look at it within our own region, within those areas that we actually can, we feel we can uh, do something. Okay, thanks very much.